in the lab we are uh, uh, our aim is to study the evolution of organ and body parts and we take the approach of comparing the gene regulatory network that uh, uh, control these uh, uh, organs or body parts in different animals and we use the snail uh, larva embryo larva as model system and the organs we are focusing more are the one relative to the feeding of this animal and so in particular the esophageal muscles and the uh, uh, pancreatic acinar cells and the posterior gut that differentiate into pyloric sphincter and intestine. And what we learned through this comparison? So we learned, for example, by comparing the esophageal muscles of the sea urchin uh, uh, larva with other many different types of muscles in different animals, in the genome gene regulatory network, you can see that there is a recurrent use of certain, I don't know, transcription factor like FOX family of transcription factor, FOX C, FOX F, then uh, signaling molecules and myo D, but the, the interaction between this gene has been rewired a lot in this different uh, Very much dramatic uh, differences at the top of the hierarchy of, uh, for example, linear specific gene activating the, the old um, cascade or uh, other genes that are extremely conserved in vertebrates like Pax 3, 7 that you have seen that are not present in the Then another case indeed is this pancreatic cell type where we learn a completely different story. In this case, we have very close connection, very shallow network between the top of the hierarchy gene and the terminal differentiation gene, even direct expression, like this PTF1A with carbocytectidase. In this case, we have a perfect conserve Oops, gene regulatory work between even CRG and, ah, oh, come on, and vertebrate. Okay, that's concerned. <laughs> <laughs> then the third case is indeed uh, the one most studied is the posterior gut, and where we see this very interesting story of two, two parox genes, x which is a molecular sequence, and CDX that are recurrent used in many animals. To pattern this, they have a very conserved topology of gene expression in all animals, including vertebrates, if you can compare here the CRG gut to the vertebrate gut. But we have a constant rewriting of this gene, and uh, uh, we have a big question here that is how uh, which are the constraints that indeed maintain the position of this gene expression in the domain so perfectly conserved while the rewriting is not And here is the acknowledgement. <laughs> who did this work, and in particular the people that are in pink in there. Um, I'm a postdoc in Rob's lab, and we basically interested to know What are the downstream targets of Hov Cox genes? So the, our interest is to build a, a gene regulatory network, which basically understand that what are the real targets, downstream targets? What are the cis regulatory elements through which the <coughs> effort is, uh, uh, regulatory function is exerted? And by that, we want to understand what is a combinatorial binding code of Hox genes, and to understand what really uh, determine the specificity of Hox genes. So what system we have, the system that we are using is the embryonic stem cell based system where we can pop in a gene of interest into a specific locus, collagenous one locus, and we can actually tag genes according to the tag that we want to tag. And then we can differentiate into a specific interest. This today's, for the today's purpose, I'm actually showing data related to neuronal fate, and we can do a variety of approaches, the genome wide approaches. So here is the result of 3,682 peaks that actually we, can, we found consistent between multiple experiments that we did where Hox A1 binds to during differentiation of ESL. And you can see a variety of enhancer, enhancer marks like P300, K27 acetylation, methylation, and ETAXI actually showing this as a putative enhancer element. So, we, so here's an example where we tested one, of, one such element which was present in DOC5 gene, intron of DOC5 gene, and you can see that 
these two elements express specifically in hind brain, and the expression, uh, expression pattern of this gene in mouse as well as in zebrafish are conserved. So, the, so that kind of shows the functional conservation of these elements across the species. We tested many more elements, and actually, this, this, this result is quite uh, reproducible. And then we look, we ask questions that what are the cofactors with which hawks A1 uh, co occupy with? And we found that, as we know previously, that these are these indeed partners with its known cofactors like PBX and MIS. But if you use other tail factors like TGIF prep and PrEP1 and PrEP2, these are other tail factors, what we find a variety of possible combinatorial binding code which actually can delineate this, this 3,600 peaks into seven distinct classes. And here is one example where actually you are testing those elements and you are, so if you test this element, you will find that uh, these elements are indeed uh, uh, regulatory elements and they do con contain uh, Hawks PBX element, which we actually deciphered through Chip Nexus, which is a high resolution chip protocol. And deletion of, of those elements in these regions can lead to loss of uh, reporter function. So that actually shows that these elements indeed contains functional Hawks PBX element, and they are uh, they are kind the elements that are we know kind of. So this finally leads to a model, which actually you can visit by lab uh, by poster and to discuss more about. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My time runs. No, yeah. Start to until you up. Okay, ready? Go. Okay. Uh, I'm not talking about development. I'm talking about adults, and so I'm interested in the gene underlying genetic architecture of adaptive traits behavior in this case, and how the underlying networks have to change or trying to understand how the expression patterns change to create this different pattern. We looked at three different things, so aggression, so the interaction between two individuals, how they kind of determine the outcome of a group living or tried group living, social context, and then actually population genetic differences. Oops, that should have been just one. So I also try to integrate a, across different levels. So I have the genotype here reflecting that we have two populations which are fixed in the difference in the propensity to be aggressive or cooperative in the same species. We have looked at the gene expression as we, they live alone, they live together with their own population mates or in paired between populations. And the behavior is aggression or more likely the propensity to act aggressive because every individual, every organism can probably react aggressively. So it's not the aggression itself, it's the propensity when they actually react aggressive. And then this has implications at the colony level phenotype. So in this particular case, we want to try the network which we can kind of derive from individual interaction of workers or queens in this particular case, how that is then kind of changed to then change the whole colony level phenotype from a single, a single queen colony to multiple queen colony, or if we abstract it from a solitary to a social living organism. And uh, all these red interactions, uh, if you want to know what they are, come to my poster, I'll tell you. Uh, not in details here, but uh, that's it. So I'll see you there with margaritas and free beer at my poster. <laughs> Hi. Hello. I'm Paolo Oliveri. So I'm as a, an offspring from Eric Davidson. My major interest lays down on networks and actually how, a little bit what Dag said, how they can evolve. And in, how they can evolve in the terms of the details. We have any specific uh, points or module where the things that might change repetitively and we have uh, um, kernels or chains or whatever it is. So in my lab, what we decided, it, it, we did it all by itself, it was to work on the skeleton of a cannabis. The reason why is the skeleton, there are many reasons. One is the skeletogenic cells is one of the best 
if it's not really the best, understood cell types in the old embryo, where we have a little bit virtually everything from transcriptomic to uh, proteomic studies, a network where I also contributed to is extremely well understood. They have an importance from uh, morphology and evolution, and uh, Dave Butcher talked today, I mean, is uh, the skeleton is what really we can trigger down in evolutionary times with our fossils, and um, also uh, has an interesting evolutionary question on itself. So per se, the skeleton as a sterium evolved as an adult skeletogenesis, these features is actually the best feature right now that we still have to identify weird shaped echinoderms as a, as a uh, fossil record. However, if we go and look at the larval stages, the skeleton is in a very extended skeleton, is present only in two of the five XM classes of echinoderm, sea urchins and ophiroids, and it actually has a limited uh, in uh, uh, olothuroids, while the other one, the starfish and the crinoids, which is the outgroup, they really don't have lar any larval skeleton. So now we can imagine okay, two evolutionary scenarios. One, that the larval skeleton evolved in the co as a common ancestor and uh, has been secondarily reduced in olothuroids, which is, would be possible since they don't even have uh, adult skeleton. Uh, or very reduced, and then lost in starfish, or it might be independently evolved in the two classes. So these allowed us, in a way, to have a set of a good character that we can see, but actually keep changing on all the different classes. So in terms of understanding how network can evolve, that would be a, a very interesting. So how do we want to proceed on that? Look into my, look into camp to see my posters, and you will see. We're gonna start it off your roids. So we're interested in immune systems, and um, uh, animal immune systems vary between different phyla, and in most phyla, they're almost completely under, not, not understood. And if you look um, in the sea urchin, when we first looked at the genome about 10 years ago, we found a very unusual immune system. It's very complex, at least from what we can see, and, but very different from other groups of animals like vertebrates and flies and things like that. So what we wanted to do was take the work of Ilya Mechnikov here that ended, well, that he stopped with these things about 100 years ago, and then kind of bring it up in kind of a more modern way with this network <laughs> biology. And so what we did, we needed a, a model, and we decided to use the larva because it's simple, and there were no pathogens of larva really known, known. So we came up with a Vibrio that we can put into the gut, and when we do that, we get a kind of um, inflammatory response that takes place over about 24 hours and will resolve if we take away the bacteria. So we've been looking at that. We've done sequenced many transcriptomes over the course of this, and have picked out all kinds of genes, some of which match things in vertebrates and things in Drosophila, and some of which are unique to the, to the echinoderms. And, and we're looking at these, and so some of these, like IL-17, we're really focusing in on because that's a major responding gene. And so the idea is eventually to take all of this and start putting it into a kind of a network um, type matrix and to really start look, being able to compare maybe between the vertebrates and the uh, and the echinoderms within deuterostems and then outside of deuterostems. And I actually have an acknowledgement slide, but I'm not gonna read it. So anyway, thanks. <laughs> 